If you pay tithes, it might be okay, or it also might be dangerous. The likelihood of you ever going to a church and having heard someone say that it's time for you to pay tithes and offerings, but we'll focus on the tithes, is pretty high. Why is that? Well, truth be told, many churches either do so one out of ignorance, not knowing what the purpose of a tithe is for, or in some cases, let's just be honest, out of greed. The issue is, though, what does that do for you? Is there a danger? So before we go into it, let's go and think about what the tithe is for. The tithe simply stands for a tenth. The tenth of what? Well, it is a tenth of what you have produced. Now, obviously, in the Old Testament, it could be and for the most part, it would be produce, animals, what have you. And there was a need for it to be done. It was given as a command to the Jews under the law. And we'll get to that point in a second why this could actually be dangerous. But the point and purpose of it was for a tithe for the land, a tithe for the temple, a tithe for the, for the Levites. Now, depending upon which scholar you're talking to, you might find that there's either three tithes or two tithes. Because of that, we're not going to really get into it because the purpose of the tithe under the old covenant is not something that we need to worry about. Why? Because it's not for us. The tithe has never been given as a command to anyone in the New Testament. Now, there's going to be a couple passages that people are going to go to, and we're going to find out that that's not the way that it should be applied. As a matter of fact, speaking of applying a passage incorrectly, one of the passages classically that you'll hear oftentimes in churches really as a means to bring about guilt, is this passage in Malachi 3. Let's start in verse 8. It says, will a man rob God? Well, the obvious answer is yes, but if a man gets an opportunity to, he probably will. But in this case, this is not speaking to us, it's speaking to the Jews. He says, yet you are robbing me, but you say how? How have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings, which is why you see oftentimes or sometimes in churches, you'll see them combine the two tithes and offerings, a tenth of what they have produced. It says, you are cursed with the curse, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the whole tithe in the storehouse so that there may be food in my house and test me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, and see if I will not open the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing until it overflows. Now, there's a little bit of a guilt, but there's also an incentive that people give to you. The problem is this just was not for us as Gentiles. This is for the, for the Jews. Now, has that purpose been reiterated in the New Testament? No, it has not. Now, people are going to say, well, what about Jesus? Jesus brings this up. Well, when Jesus brings it up, he's not commanding them to pay tithes. There's two times that I can think of when someone brings up tithes. First time is in Matthew 23, as well as also this, this story is also reiterated in Luke. And then also with the, uh, uh, the, the young man who says that I pay tithes twice a week in order to show that he keeps the law. But we don't see Jesus saying that you must do so. Look what he says in Matthew 23, 23. He says, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. Why? For you tithe mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weighty provisions of the law. So in this case, Jesus is not saying you must tithe. Now, under the old covenant, at, in this time, this dispensation, the Jews were required to do so because the need for it was still there. However, that's going to change in a little bit. And what we're going to notice is going forward at the establishment of the church, there is no command to pay the tithe. However, someone's going to say, well, what about Abraham? The tithe was in existence before the law. Again, you can pay a tithe. You can pay any percentage that you want. You can pay 5%. You can pay 13%. If you pay 10%, what is that called? A tithe. There's an actual name to a tenth, which is a tithe. That's literally what it means. Abraham gives a tithe to Melchizedek. Remember in uh, Galatians, I'm sorry, Genesis 14, 20, it says, And blessed be Mo God most high, who has delivered your enemies into your hand, and he gave him a tenth of all this Abram giving a tithe to Melchizedek. Was Abraham required to do so? We don't know. The Bible doesn't say that he was forced to do so. Maybe he was. Maybe he wasn't. It doesn't say. And so because he gave a tenth, that means that, well, the tithe was in existence. Well, the term tithe was around. Ten percent was around at the time. But there was no command that we know of. And that's the key point that we know of. We don't have a command that we know of to pay the tithe. And if there were such a command, it was not a command for us to follow. There's a such thing as primary application and secondary application. So primary application means that if it's for us, God would have made it clear and we would have to apply this to us. The primary application would be not just for them, but also for us. And so in this case, we don't see that. We don't see that with Abram. We don't see that with the Jews. That is not us. That's not the dispensation that we're in. 
What we do find, though, is that the disciples at the first day of the week began collecting offerings. Why? So they can have all things in common. On the first day of the week, this is 1 Corinthians 16, 2. On the first day of the week, each of you is to put aside and save as he may prosper so that no collection may be made when I come. In other words, as he comes, he's going to pick up so that other people in the body can also have who aren't doing as well. But he says to do so on the first day of the week so that when he comes, it was just out of convenience. Now, was it a command to do it on the first day of the week? Not necessarily, but he said to put it aside uh, as you save, as he may prosper. Notice what's missing, an actual amount, an actual percentage. And so we cannot say that there's a command to do so. Now, as a matter of fact, we see them wanting to kind of bring money in so that the so that the body can be blessed. The, the, the running of the ministry can be taken care of. As a matter of fact, Agabus in Acts comes down and says, says that there's going to be a famine. And so we should have this collection so that other people can be taken care of during this famine. And so you kind of see the principle of this, you know, kind of being even put out. But again, there is no percentage, no tithe, no, no percentage that's given. The only time that we see that this is commanded is in the old covenant where they're supposed to give, such as in Leviticus 27, 30 says, thus all the tithe of the land of the seed of the land or of the fruit of the tree is the Lord. It's holy to the Lord. This is their command. This is to be separated and set aside for the Lord. That provision has not been followed or carried out uh, in this new dispensation after the cross. We don't see this. What we do see, though, is this right here. We see in Second Corinthians 9, 7, he says, each one must do just as he has purpose in his heart, not grudgingly. So we're not supposed to give grudgingly with a frown or under compulsion. That's the point. You cannot say that someone has to give a certain amount, but then turn around and say that you, you don't have to force them to give under a certain compulsion. Making a person give at least 10%, that is a compulsion. Now, he says that what how you ought to do is you ought to give cheerfully. God loves a cheerful Giver. By the way, this is the word, the Greek word where we get the English word hilarious. So God loves a hilarious or a happy or a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you so that always having all sufficiency in everything, you may have an abundance of every good deed. And what God is going to bless you with is not necessarily going to be money. Uh, it might be in other areas. And so even when they refer to uh, in the Gospels, give and it shall be given to you, pressed down, shaken forward, shaken, uh, shaken together and running over. Again, that's a way that people will put this together to make you say, to kind of guilt you into giving. Will God bless you for giving? Sure. How is it going to bless so? Will it be monetarily? Not necessarily. It might be in other ways. God does want you. Now, let's be clear. God does want us to give. It's the amount in question that's been the source of debate. Give according to this, this, this command that Paul gives or the statement that Paul gives, gives with a cheerful heart. Give out of love. However you purpose, notice what he says, however you have purposed in your heart, verse 7. So if in your heart you desire to give 14%, that's fine. If you desire to give 4%, if you desire to give 10%, if you desire to actually give a tenth, that is fine if you purpose that in your heart. Where it becomes a problem, and I mentioned earlier, where this can become a danger, if you obligate yourself as a result of the law to give 10%. If you're going to force yourself or say that I have to give 10%, then I would be violating the law. I would be committing a sin if I don't. And I must do this as a result of what the law says. Then what you're doing is you're obligating yourself under the law. And that is a person, if that person has obligated themselves under the law and their salvation is contingent upon them keeping the law, that person cannot be saved. Why do I say so? And this is why it's dangerous. Notice what he says in Galatians 5, 4. This is, matter of fact, let's start in verse 3. He says, and I testify again to every man who receives circumcision that he is under obligation to keep the whole law. You have been severed from Christ, whoever you are, you that are seeking to be justified by the law. You have been, you have fallen from grace. And so if there's a person who says they trust in the work of the cross, but then what they really are trusting in is the work of the law. That person has been cut off. What is the work of the law? Trying to keep the law by giving these tithes. Again, it's okay if you decide in your heart, if you purpose in your heart to give a tithe, to give 10% of which, that's fine. Just like if you purpose to give in your heart, 8.5%, 12%, that's fine. Now he does say, Paul does say, 
if that extra 0.2%, if that extra dollar is going to cause you to give a frown, then don't give it. God doesn't need your money. That part should be understood. God doesn't need anything from you, but he does love a cheerful giver. And so if giving $100 keeps you smiling, amen. If $101 makes you frown, don't give the $101. Don't sin while you're trying to give. You cannot guilt God into doing anything for you, and God is not trying to guilt you. Give according to your heart. Now, should you think about what God has done for you and what you can give? Amen. But don't let someone guilt you into giving something. Give your rent money. Give your mortgage money. Give your life. No, we're not going to give bill money. We're not going to give the money that's obligated. But give what you can give. Make God a priority as you give. That part is understood. But for someone to make you give a certain percentage, that person is also sinning. Do not participate in that. You do not have to pay a tithe. Do you have to give something? You should give something. That part is also understood. But if you are trying to make it into heaven by keeping all of the law, you will miss all of heaven because you cannot keep any of it, including the tithe. Amen.